Mathematics has been described as the science of patterns, and uh, in mathematics there are patterns in numbers, in shapes, in probability, in motion, and nature has visible regularities that I see more than I ever used to, because now I'm looking for them. They're everywhere, really, and if we have the eyes to see them, we can really enjoy them as well as try and understand them. This is the greatest free show on earth. And I think that if I can just get my students to put down their cell phones and concentrate on this world around them, they can see wonderful beauty. And I hope it will excite them as it does me. And what always excites me is that the stunning variety of shapes and patterns to be found in the natural world are all the result of Mother Nature following biological, chemical, physical principles and the underlying mathematical structures. And in the world of nature, one of the most basic rules is always be efficient. Nature does appear to seek the most economical, the most efficient ways of achieving her end. She seeks to minimize energy. It is certainly the case that a lot of mathematical models of natural processes involve minimization schemes. And one of those natural minimization schemes is don't expend energy if you don't have to, just like some of my students. Some of the most primitive creatures, such as sponges and corals, simply let their food waft over them. In technical terms, they are asymmetrical. For most creatures, some sort of symmetry is both important and revealing. Look at the sea anemone. It's another creature that doesn't move, or at least not very much. And it displays what's known as radial symmetry. You can cut through a sea anemone at basically any angle, and the cross section will always be the same. A nice variation on radial symmetry is rotational symmetry. Starfish, for example, if you carefully arrange the, uh, the stars on the starfish, the, uh, then you will have pentagonal symmetry, which means that there are five axes of symmetry, each at an angle of 72 degrees from the next one. We see it in flowers. Uh, vincas, I believe, are pentagonally symmetric. You've only got to rotate through a certain angle to leave the flower indistinguishable approximately from where it was before. Closer to home, if you carefully cut through an apple, you'll find the pits arranged in a pentagonally symmetrical pattern. But the commonest type of symmetry, by far, is what's known as bilateral symmetry. Nearly all creatures on the planet exhibit bilateral symmetry and again it has to do with mobility. Any designer would put an organism's senses and its mouth at the head of the organism's motion. In bilaterally symmetrical animals that immediately presumes an up and a down and also left and right. There's so much going on in the natural world, so many different causes and effects that one might look for a unifying principle to describe that. And I would say elegance and efficiency uh, is probably the one. Take a look at a beehive, for example. We're all familiar with the hexagons in a honeycomb, but why hexagons? Why not circles, which have a minimum perimeter for a given area? Surely that's a superb example of efficiency. Unfortunately, the problem with circles is that you can't pack them together without leaving gaps. So the nearest regular polygon that comes to a circle is the regular hexagon. And so those six sides minimize the perimeter for a given area. And that may have something to do with the way uh, beehives are constructed, because the bees, whether they know it or not, are superb engineers, and it turns out, given those space-filling constraints, that hexagons use the least wax for the most storage space. And the icing on the cake, if you're a bee, 
is that for every six hexagons you make, you get another one for free. Hexagons are a recurrent theme in nature, turning up in geological formations, insect eyes, and perhaps most famously, in snowflakes. When you hear the statement, and it's often heard, that every snowflake is individual, is unique. It's true, but it depends at the on the scale at which you're looking at it. Because if I just look at them on my sleeve as they fall on my dark coat, uh, yes, some are bigger, some are smaller, but I don't really get a sense of the uniqueness at the level that uh, we're talking about. And if you go down very, very closely with a microscope, if you could imagine the molecules, then they're all the same. No one ice molecule is different from any other. That six-fold symmetry is, in, a, in an amazing way, perpetuated through the different scales. And so we see the six-fold symmetry, the hexagonal symmetry in snowflakes because of that, and yet they are different. There's little irregularities, perhaps, so they're not exactly uh, hexagonally symmetric. So in that sense, everyone is different. But uh, the life history depends on, of course, like human beings, where we've been, what we've experienced, what we've encountered. So each snowflake falls a different path to the Earth, uh, and therefore it falls through different regions, regions of different humidity, different temperature, uh, buffeted by the, the wind perhaps, melting a little bit and then refreezing. So in that sense, yes, they are utterly unique. They are an excellent example of one of nature's favorite mathematical features, deterministic chaos. One of the features of deterministic chaos is that there is an inbuilt sensitivity to initial conditions. And that applies to the snowflake in the sense that each one has its own unique path through its brief lifetime. This is one of the features of chaos that uh, a small variation in the initial conditions, and this is related to what's known as the butterfly effect, can uh, induce uh, downstream, so to speak, in time, very different circumstances. The butterfly effect seems really, really silly. A butterfly flapping its wings somewhere in South America could give rise to some enormous storm over Japan. Now, this sounds almost sort of zen, but it's certainly part of what is known as deterministic chaos. So that's why the weather is actually unpredictable beyond a few days, because some slight change can be replicated en masse downstream, so to speak, a few days later. And so the structure of the weather is inherently unpredictable. We can get a broad idea over a few days, and even perhaps into 10 days, but nevertheless, uh, th there's an ultimate limitation there. Often, the manifestation of deterministic chaos in nature produces complex shapes and forms that have a fractal-like structure. A fractal is essentially, crudely speaking, a picture of chaos. Um, there, is, uh, there are several ways of looking at fractals, but essentially, they are things, they are geometric entities which have the same geometric or statistical properties no matter how small, how far down you go, how much you magnify them. Let me um, give you a classic example uh, of the Cook or Koch snowflake curve, which is uh, beloved of many students, especially the ones I teach, because it's so fascinating. You take an equilateral triangle. Every side is the same length. You then remove the middle third of each side and put another little equilateral triangle, or at least two, two sides of it on there. So you've got a sort of star. And you continue that process. This is called iteration. You continue it ad infinitum. And what you end up with is a crinkly, wonderful shape pattern which actually has infinite length and finite area because it can be enclosed in a circle. It's therefore got finite area. And this is the archetype, or one of them, of, of fractals. Uh, another fractal of note is the Sierpinski triangle, or the Sierpinski gasket. If you take a, an equilateral triangle 
and mark the midpoint of each side and join those points together. You've got another triangle pointed downwards, as it were. Paint that black or remove it. And then do the same thing with the remaining three white triangles. If you continue that process, you get a, a strange shape that seems to appear on some shells, which has these triangles, these patterns, to several different scales. And that appears to be the result of some chemical process that I don't understand, but that uh, mimics in some way this uh, Sierpinski triangle, at least to several levels down. And it's quite fascinating. They're beautiful. It's wonderful. I try to get across, I don't know, the beauty of nature. When I translate all this into the classroom, it's very easy to get excited and passionate about it. And I think it's a wonderful tool for younger children as well uh, to try and instill in them the curiosity. Well, they have the curiosity, younger children. It's not been um, dissipated uh, from them. But just to focus them and, and ask questions. What's going on here? What's that? It's, it's just wonderful. Science is all about asking questions. And in that sense, scientists and mathematicians are still kids.